Oh my god, I cannot breathe. Hello, you're free. I believe that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is Iboga. Shamanic practice is to actually go visit yourself at your own death. Withdraw your permission. Tell it to get the hell out of here. They use crushed seashells, coca leaves, and saliva. Then I land back on Earth. Everybody thinks it's just been three years, but it's been maybe three lifetimes for me. The Hunting for Healers podcast. Hey there, you've reached Frank Vogt on the Hunting for Healer podcast. I'm here in my Manhattan acupuncture studio. You might be able to hear some construction going on outside. It's quite annoying. It's kind of the deal with the Manhattan spaces. Uh, but I'm too impatient to like wait till I get home. I just want to get this thing out there. So I apologize if you have some background noise. It's just for my intro, which is probably something you can scoot past anyway. But not before I tell you what this episode is about. Lyme disease. I had it. Hopefully don't have it, but had it. Two years ago, I struggled with it in a big time way. Oh man, I had uh, started with fever and chills and I didn't know what it was at first. I was in Greece, so I thought maybe it was West Nile virus, very tropical. But I, when I came back to the States, I started having these grabbing pains, these squeezing pains. I uh, felt like I was being pushed through a food processor. Uh, eventually got the diagnosis, got some of my own herbs involved, obviously, self-acupuncture, Chinese herbs, researched, and uh, targeted doxycycline antibiotics of choice for Lyme, and uh, seemed to do the trick. So the question is, what's the difference? You know, why do why did I get through it? Intense, done, and why have other friends of mine, patients, struggled with it uh, in, in an elongated way? What's the difference? Dr. Tanya Dempsey of the AIM Center for Personal privatized was it, personal medicine uh, over in Westchester County, New York. She thinks she might have an answer and she's working with mast cell. The mast cells are part of the white blood cell immune response. She gets into why they could be involved and how she's treating them as maybe the difference maker for how to get a handle on Lyme disease infections and co-infections. Of course, it's not just Lyme. There are many factors involved here. And this is why this is a two-part series, two parts here. This is the first part because the first thing I am is a clinician and I have to treat it in order to help people. And I got treated. And Dr. Tanya Dempsey is treating people. And that's my first interest because if we don't do that, nothing else really matters, as she states in the interview. However, I'm curious. And so as I started looking this up, I was like, what the hell? Where the hell did this come from? What's the issue here? How did it explode out of nowhere in such a local area in the United States, Northeast and pockets of Midwest and such? And I might've found an answer, uh, but we'll get into that. Chapter two is the dark history of Lyme disease, um, how it came about. And there is some evidence and I have, uh, I'm not even gonna tell you, I'm just gonna keep it a secret for my next interview, which I'm gonna record next week and hopefully have out in a couple of weeks. Part two of Lyme is, uh, the dark history of Lyme disease. It's sort of like the American Chernobyl, for real. So anyway, enjoy this podcast. Dr. Tanya Dempsey, I think is the type of doctor we all wanna see, someone who gives us the time, doesn't think we're crazy, and does the extra work to go outside the box and really think about new strategies for dealing with something that's not treated well across the United States. Let's do it. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Dr. Tanya Dempsey, I'm so happy to spend this time with you. I think it's very timely, you know, where I, I think I heard that May is Lyme month. Is that true? It is. So going over a lot of the literature for Lyme disease, and I really love what you're doing in terms of the work, getting very specific and with, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like mast cell issues, right? These issues that have to do with our immune cell, white blood cells, and mm -hmm. overactive in certain constitutions, mm -hmm. and that being a possible key element in some people's very prolonged and very difficult bouts with Lyme disease. Correct, 
Correct. You know, I think really one of the key points that I'd like to make is that, you know, many, many people all over the world, and particularly in my neck of the woods, really, which is New York and sort of the tri-state area. I mean, lots of people have been infected, right? But not everyone gets sick, right? Some people will get the typical bullseye rash, you know, maybe that's that's definitely in less than 50%. And I would argue probably in less than 20% of people. Right. There's some people who will be infected, won't get the won't get the typical bullseye rash and will not get sick. Or they may have some like sort of chronic things that pop up, but again, they're generally healthy. And then, you know, then's the population that I see. And these are people who have been infected. And over time, their immune system has become dysfunctional. Maybe their immune system was dysfunctional already. And I would argue that that's more likely the case, that there was already some issue. Right. Then, then there are these triggers over time, infection, environmental exposure, stress, stress, emotional stress, mental stress, physical stress. And then the infection sort of then just sort of comes out and the whole immune system becomes completely out of whack and dysfunctional. And that's where this mast cell piece comes in because I because what's becoming more obvious to me the longer I do this is that I, what I realize is that the people who are the sickest are the ones whose immune system is dysfunctional. The majority, I would say 90% of the time, it was dysfunctional before they may or may not have known that. And then everything kind of goes haywire or they really were fine. The infection takes their immune system hostage and then, and then they have this whole host of symptoms that come from that. Right. And the symptomatology in, in my experience is very much, if you think about what Lyme causes, what Bartonella causes, what Babesia causes, there's some typical things that those, those infections can cause. And obviously there are lots of other infections, but, but most of the symptoms actually are driven through, through the mast cell and how the mast cell responds to this, you know, perceived attack. So we'll get back to the mast cell. So I I would love to learn how you got into this work specifically and what it is about your practice that may differentiate it from so much of how mainstream biomedicine deals head on with Lyme disease? Yeah, you know, I started very conventionally. And, you know, I came from an internal medicine background, I was trained in internal medicine, I, you know, I went to, you know, the number one medical school in the country before that. And I, you know, really, you know, really saw medicine in a, in a certain way, that's sort of how traditional doctors look at things, right? There's, there's always there's a there's a symptom, and then there's a solution, right? And what, but while I was going through my training, even starting back at medical school, what was really interesting to me was how I was able to compartmentalize my life. So in my life, I understood the impact of diet, of exercise, of stress, of all these things, right? So I was doing all these things. And, and some of my, some of my colleagues really interestingly, remember, I just had my 25th medical school reunion last weekend. And some of them were joking with me about how they remember me carrying around the vitamin book that I that I that I was you know talking about it in medical school. Well, we didn't learn about vitamins, we didn't learn about health, but I was so interested in it, and I was always helping everybody else out. So I was able to compartmentalize for years. And then what happened was at some point I was not able to compartmentalize. I saw the impact of certain things in my life and I was not able to help my patients the way I was helping myself or my family. And eventually I had to split. I had to really take on what is known as integrative medicine. I didn't even realize I was doing integrative medicine. I just saw it as looking at the whole person, understanding how everything connects. And I think that that then treating then understanding Lyme disease in the area of the country that I'm at and chronic diseases just sort of explodes from there because once you're open to all of that, then it's sort of, it's inevitable that you're gonna to start to see patients who are dealing with chronic chronic issues. You know? So in that sense, you're really responding to what the patients are bringing you rather than saying, this is what I wanna do and this is what I'm gonna treat. It's growing at such a rapid rate patients are presenting you with this and you're learning from them and then that's affecting how you treat them. 
Correct. I mean, everything, everything that I do, and I say this to my patients all the time, I, I'm learning from them every single day. Yeah. There's not one day that goes by that I don't get a pearl yeah. from a patient and learn and think about how that's going to impact, you know, other patients. But to be honest, even sometimes with that, it's not, it's not, it's not enough understanding how it's working in one patient. It's not always going to help me with all my other patients, but they're going to be pearls that I'm going to take. Right. So. For sure. For sure. Now, when you're diagnosing and you're making differential diagnosis, your, what are the things that really pop out to you to say this, this patient may be one of the ones I'm going to look for for mast cell proliferation and having a problem there? Okay, so let's, let's clarify a couple of things just right out the bat. Mm. So what we're talking about is mast cell activation syndrome. Okay. okay, there is another condition known as mastocytosis, which is a proliferation of mast cells. It is a cancer and it's re- relatively rare. You know, I really probably have at this point, maybe a handful of patients with true mastocytosis, that's proliferation. What we're talking about here are patients who have normal numbers of mast cells, they're just more reactive, right? And And the reason they're more reactive is probably mutational, right? There's something genetic that has happened to those mast cells. There may be a genetic component on a, on a wider cellular level, but also in the mast cells themselves get mutated, even if, so there's some, again, hereditary factors. So, so often in these patients, we can trace back in, in other family members, some aspects that, that might apply to mast cell activation syndrome, but then the mast cells themselves get dysfunctional with additional triggers and other effects from, from infection, you know, the world around them, stressors, et cetera. So generally speaking, what I'm doing right now is I would say that all my Lyme patients, anybody's coming to me for, so I see patients who come to me, they don't know they have chronic uh, Lyme or other infections. They are coming to me because they don't know what they have, right? But I have other patients who come to me with a diagnosis of Lyme or or looking for a diagnosis of of Lyme or co-infections. And, and I would say that, that the majority of those patients, when I do a very thorough history, I will find features that support that diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome. So I'm, look, I'm trying to be open. It's hard because it's my specialty. So it's hard to not see it in a lot of things, yeah. but, but I really try to keep an open mind and I tell patients, I'm not diagnosing you, but mm. when I take that history and the history I take is from u- in utero, the patients in utero in their mother, if they know that history, right? There are patients who are adopted, they don't know. But if they know the history, we start in utero and even before the health of the mother. And then we go all the way up until like today, they're sitting in my office and what are they, you know, what are they, you know, what are they experiencing? Yeah. And very often, again, this is not 100% of the time, but, but very often there's, there are these themes that you hear from their history. You hear sometimes it's allergic, allergic-like. You do not need to have any allergy symptoms to have mast cell activation syndrome, but there are like three themes that we see, we see very commonly. I would say plus minus allergic, right? So you don't need it, but maybe, or there may be some family history of allergic phenomena, plus minus inflammation. And I would say by far, that's like the most common because you can think of inflammation Think about all patients who are chronically ill with various conditions. Obviously, they have a lot of inflammation. So again, maybe mast cell activation syndrome is at the root. And plus minus, we'll call it abnormal growth and development or aberrant growth and development. So interestingly, mast cells are very much involved in, in healing, in growth, when they're normal, when they're, when they're reacting, when they're inappropriate and they release these chemicals that are, that are very inflammatory, they can cause the release of, they can, they can cause the, the growth of, let's say, cysts or tumors or, or abnormal connective tissue or collagen issues. And you start to see, so that like becomes like this very broad category. So when I see patients that have one or more of those you know, themes, then they deserve a workup for mast cell activation syndrome. 
Sure. I imagine it must take a lot of discipline, like you said, to not jump right in every time. I mean, just learning about this for the last few days, I had a patient come in this morning for cysts and fibroids and who has a very strong allergic reaction and allergies and stuff. And immediately my mind was popping to that. So I'd imagine that you're making those connections all the time and you have to kind of stay in your lane to make sure that you're, you know, that you're not putting the horse before the cart. Your mind is not jumping to it. But well, I'm sure. In, with a lot of practice, I'm sure you're getting really subtle, subtle distinctions because you see it so much. Cor- yeah, correct. But my mind does does you know jump to it. I can't help it. But but I feel very strongly about getting data. Right. There are colleagues mm-hmm. of mine who are treating this, and they're treating it empirically, right. and they're basing it on history, and that's okay. But it sort of does a disservice to the patient because the patient deserves a diagnosis because a diagnosis then allows you to treat them uh, more systematically, offers more options than if you don't have. So if you don't have a diagnosis, you can start with some natural antihistamines or pharmacologic antihistamines. You can kind of do some stuff, but then you sort of wouldn't go to the, the more aggressive treatment if you didn't have a diagnosis. And so I feel very strongly, you know, with patients, I say, you know, I think you have it, you know, you have a lot of features of it, but let's, you know, we can start some simple treatment just so that you're not waiting so long, but let's do the, do the testing. Sometimes we need several rounds of testing to really get to the diagnosis, but then they have a diagnosis that they can prove to other doctors because many of these patients have really been treated very poorly by the medical profession. It's, it's really embarrassing to me that there are doctors out there who treat patients the way a lot of my patients have been treated. So I want them to, to not be thought of as crazy because they're not crazy. This is yeah. not, right, this is, this is a physiological problem. They're not making it up. And, and so when they carry a diagnosis that's been proven and you have laboratory data, then these patients can go to these doctors and get treated appropriately, right? They go to the ER and they carry a diagnosis. They're not just, again, thought of as, as um, you know, making it up or, or crazy. It's really, it's really, I'm really disgusted, to be honest with you, how doctors treat a lot of these patients. So that's why I feel so strongly about they have to have a diagnosis, you know? Do you think it's a sense of fear that a lot of physicians have in terms of like delving into the unknown that if they open this Pandora's box, they're not going to know, you know, what they know and what they don't know that it's, what, what do you think is the resistance there to going to some of these places that, that people are really suffering with? You know, I, I think it's probably multifactorial. I think that there's, there are some doctors who just are used to being in their box and anything outside their box just doesn't feel comfortable, right? They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know, essentially. Some of it is that, you know, they, I, I think some doctors are feel very uh, uncomfortable with patients knowing more than they know. So there's definitely like an ego aspect to this. So a lot of these patients have been, you know, they're, they're listening to my podcast. They're reading about, you know, right. other people who are writing on this, right? They are so well-educated. And if they weren't before, they become educated, right? Because they want to advocate for themselves. And I feel very strongly about that. But I think there's some doctors who feel a little bit, you know, insecure. And that's unfortunate, right? It's not like it shouldn't be ever about the doctor. It's always about the patient. But unfortunately, I think that's that realm. And I think that there are just some doctors who have read the literature, right? I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that they have read the stuff. They don't feel comfortable attributing the symptoms to that, right? So, you know, I think about it like one of the things I do is I'm ruling out a lot of things. I'm not just trying to prove mass cell activation syndrome. I'm trying to disprove a lot of other things, right? I want to make sure there really isn't something bad happening, right? I'm not going to blame everything on this. So when you've ruled out everything else, and this is what's what's left, right? And you can, and it explains the patient's condition, right? Then you can feel comfortable with it. But but some pa- some doctors feel that this doesn't necessarily explain everything. And and again, which I which I would argue with and send them to different literature. But yeah, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit odd. But I, you know, how how doctors respond to this. But I think for me, that's why I love doing things like this and podcasts and getting the word out because I think the more people are educated. From both from the patient perspective and the doctor's perspective, 
the better we're going to be going forward. So I'm very optimistic that over time, you know, people will will feel better. I mean, I, I, I understand this better. You know, I just I mentioned I did my I had my 25th medical school reunion uh, from Johns Hopkins this past weekend. And they asked the alumni to present 15 minutes. They had a 50, we have a 50 minute block of you to present, you know, your research and what you're interested in. And I just jumped on it. If I can talk about mass cell activation syndrome for 15 minutes, even right, well, I'll take whatever. And I can educate my colleagues who are not in the integrative world. I mean, sometimes when I do podcasts like this, I'm preaching to the choir, right? right. I wanted to preach to like, you know, the opposite. I wanted people to be like, oh, I never thought of that, right? Right. So I love doing that because, again, if you can just plant a seed, then maybe that next patient you see, you kind of, you know, make it a little differently. What was the reception like? Do you feel like they took you in? I I can't tell. I couldn't tell. Yeah. I just, you know what? I was happy. I got, I got it out there, but I, I didn't get any feedback. I didn't get any questions. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, for whatever that's worth. So let's, let's take an eagle eye, a, a bird's eye view of this and scan back. And first of all, are, are you as a clinician, are you at, at all interested in, in understanding more about how Lyme came about in, in such a drastic way? Is, is that something that you find helpful to explore and to think about? Yeah, I mean, I, not so much with the individual patient, but right. yeah, absolutely. I think about a lot of these things, like why are we seeing more chronic disease than we've ever have, right? Mm-hmm. So I think about this a lot. You know, I have a practice that is geared towards treating complex multi-system diseases. So am I seeing more Lyme disease? Am I seeing sicker people? Am I seeing more mast cell because of the population that comes to me? Or in general, are we seeing more of this, you know, across the board? And I, I think back, you know, when I was in, in my regular, you know, traditional medical practice, it's now 11 years ago, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I saw a lot of people with diabetes and high blood pressure, you know, obesity, there were some like of the, the common chronic diseases. Yeah. I didn't see that much of what I'm seeing now. And so is that because you know, again, I have a skewed view. So I, but I think about just the, the earth we live on, you know, live on the, mm-hmm. the, the things that we are dealing with in the 21st century that we didn't have to deal with 20 years ago, 50 years ago, hundred years ago. So I think about the shift, you know, that, that we've seen what patients bodies have to deal with now that we yeah. didn't have to deal with before, whether it's, EMFs, right? So I, you know, I'm on this computer, I have my phone, ne- my cell phone next to me, right? I always think about like, how is that impacting people? How is it impacting infection, like in their immune system, and how their body deals with it, you know, you know, I try not to get too much into the, the sort of controversial areas of, of, you know, where Lyme came from and Lyme was, was, you know, released from Plum Island. You know, I know there's all these controversial stuff. I try not to go there because it doesn't matter, to be honest, at this point, we are in the situation we're in, but I look to the future. What can we do to, to change what patients are dealing with? How, how can we change uh, the world around them and, and, and what they, can they do for themselves to make so that they're healthier, right? That's, that's all we can do. Yeah, for sure. So when, when you're exploring some of these subjects and one of the things I have found fascinating is that, so as an herbalist, I, you know, one of the things is I help treat conditions with herbology. And then one thing I noticed was that some invasive herbs like Japanese knotweed Mm-hmm. which is one of the ones traditionally used in Chinese medicine to treat some infectious diseases that are presenting similar to Lyme or other co-infections. That Japanese knotweed proliferates now and is really all over the place in areas where there's a lots of deer population. Mm-hmm. And so in one sense, yeah, the knotweed came from Asia or Japan and, and sort of was an invasive herb or, or plant. But on another hand, it's almost like I, I, I sometimes wonder how nature is responding to things and, and showing us or allowing things to grow that may have answers for some of the problems we have. And that the very root, which is, you know, something I'm trying to get rid of on my property because it grows all by the streams and stuff. But the very root of that plant is something that treats Lyme from a Chinese medicine perspective. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I think about that too. And I think it's fascinating. 
And, you know, we, we are, there, the lessons are all around us, right? The information is all around us, but you have to be, you know, tapped into that, right? You have to be aware of what, I, yeah, I've read about the Japanese knotweed phenomenon. I, I think it's, yeah. It's Do you use any herbs in your practice, like quercetin-based things and? No, I use a lot, right? So sure, quercetin, yeah. you know, could be useful for some mast cell activation syndrome patients. It could be useful in Lyme and other immune stuff, but it's certainly not right for everyone, right? Yeah. So it's certainly not, you know, what I've learned about herbs, I use a lot of herbs is that, you know, you really have to kind of figure out the patient and how to dose it and what's going to be appropriate. And sometimes it backfires and sometimes it's great. But yeah, I use, you know, plenty of different, I have several different, I would say, herbal protocols that I'll use depending on the infections I'm trying to treat or the immune dysregulation that I'm trying to treat. Sometimes I'm using the herbs alone. Sometimes I'm using the herbs alongside anti, you know, antibiotics or, you know, pharmaceutical antimicrobials, again, depending on the patient. Yeah. Sometimes patients don't need the antibiotics. Sometimes we can, we can get away with doing the work that we need by rebalancing their, their body and setting sure. the foundation, right? And, and when that happens, when herbs work and diet and exercise, all these other things that are, you know, the sort of the foundation of, of functional medicine or integrative medicine, you know, yeah, a lot of patients will, will respond, their body heals, right? And so the infection almost doesn't become it's not as important anymore. Whereas, and I know that's sort of funny saying, I say that to some patients and I think they think like, where did the infection go? What do you mean it's not important? You know, my hygienics test showed I had Lyme. And what I say is that, yeah, sometimes the bugs persist and sometimes the persistence of the infection is the problem and we have to kill. And sometimes the persistence of the infection is because the immune system is is dysregulated Mm -hmm. and i can give you all the antibiotics in the world and it's not going to work because i've got to work on the other you know the other stuff and that's where i think herbs can be very very helpful right you know skull cap bako skull cap japanese Mm -hmm. knotweed you know sort of like you know kind of a very common two common herbs that i use very frequently and then i you know i might i might use something like a cat's claw i might use and then if i'm going like really kind of getting into the more antimicrobial route i might i might say you know if they have babesia or parasites i, I use a lot of artemisia or artemisinin Chain you know out, yeah and right and and cryptolepis which also has some good antiparasitic anti-babesia properties, you know, so again, sometimes I'm, I'm killing and I'm using herbs in that way. And sometimes I'm rebalancing and, and setting a foundation. Does that, does that make sense with what you do? Yeah, it's great. And, and, you know, the lens I'm, I'm looking at when I'm using herbs is a Chinese medicine pattern diagnosis, but uh, it is interesting and, and probably necessary to also think about the biology of it. So with these herbs, are these herbs that tend to kill the spirochetes in some way that they're working on that aspect of the infection? And, and if so, how do they do that? You know, I think that, that there are herbs that probably have that property again of, of killing. Yeah. And so with Lyme disease, you know, we're talking about spirochetes, but Babesia is sort of an, is a, is a parasite. It's a, it's a, it's a blood parasite essentially, right? So it's in the red blood cells. So that that has a different cycle. It's killed differently. Bartonella again also has a different sort of form to it, and so other things are going to work on it. So, so again, there are herbs. So I look at herbs because I'm not trained in Chinese medicine, right. but I understand, you know, because I've done a lot of reading on my own. But I might use herbs in a more traditional way, you know, in a more Western way, I guess, you know, looking at, again, the function of the herb and, again, what I'm trying to do. So, again, yes, some things I do think have that antimicrobial property. But to me, herbs are better for helping the immune system and shifting the immune system in a way to less cytokine production and less inflammation. I think that that's where herbs, that's in my opinion, that's where I see the benefit of the herbs. But again, there are some herbs that, yeah, you layer on top and you get some killing properties from it. Yeah. And I also love thinking of herbs as in terms of being envoys to go to certain areas of the body. And so they they focus the body's response in certain ways, which is similar to acupuncture. Hey, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So interesting. Now, so, a few summers ago, I had Lyme, 
And I, I didn't know at first because I was in Greece and it, it came out and I was like, do I have West Nile virus? Because I was having night sweats and all sorts of, but I realized it was from a prior infection here later on. So, I, but I thought it'd be interesting to ask you about some of the symptoms that arise and, and why the biology of the body is responding in that way. So it can start from the very beginning, like the first sign I would have would be fevers and night sweats and things like that. What is going on there? I mean, why is the body responding in that way? You know, I, I, what happens with any infection in general, right, is the infection enters the body and the immune system starts to see it, starts to build up an immune response. There are, you have different layers of the immune system. You have the innate immune system, which is sort of what we call the primitive immune system, where the mast cells really are part of. Then you have the adaptive immune system, which is more of the antibodies. And, the, and so again, like a more, you know, more modern immune system, I guess, is, is one way you can call it. So initially, when you get infected, you have the innate immune system that comes on the scene. There are a number of other cells and other, again, other parts of the immune system that are going to react. The mast cells are going to see, they're going to try to, they're going to degranulate, they're going to release their, their mediators. Mast cells make you know, over a thousand different mediators. They're very inflammatory. They are, you know, some of them are cytokines. And so you can imagine that if I just even look at it from the level of the mast cell, the mast cell sees the Lyme, the spirochete, it starts to attack, right? And that's going to cause an inflammatory reaction, right? And you're going you're gonna to have, you know, sweats, fever, uh, chills, headaches, you know, could be, could be nausea, could be stomach pain, right? Everyone sort of reacts differently. Not all patients get fever with Lyme. They right. just might ha have some malaise. Right. Uh, they might be achy, you know, myalgias or even some joint pain, right? So there's this inflammatory reaction that starts first. Then interestingly with, with Lyme, what you, what you sometimes see is there's almost like a period of calm. So the immune system went into high gear, tried to right. fight this, and maybe actually it's it's fighting, but then all of a sudden there's like, like I call it the calm before the storm. So some patients will see after a few weeks that they they might have they might be feeling better. And I'm talking about patients, let's say, that are not, you know, taking antibiotics, they don't know they have Lyme, right? Sure. They feel really bad, it's like a flu-like illness. And then the immune system sort of calms down. And then what's unique about about Lyme, that, that, that spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi, is that it can start to evade the immune system. It can change forms. And so at that point, the adaptive immune system should be kicking in. There should be antibody production to try to continue to fight. And in some patients, so some patients will mount that attack. They'll start to build antibodies and maybe they'll, you know, their, their body will just, you know, be okay you know, even without antibiotics, I would say that's kind of probably, or, or antibiotics or herbs, let's just say, right? You know, that's probably rare. With more pa patients than not, what happens is the, that adaptive immune system never really kicks in enough. So the antibodies are not being produced enough. The, the bug is evading. It's starting to damage. It's going into the joints, potentially jet damaging joints. It can go into the heart, damage the heart, can go into the GI tract and damage the GI tract, right? You start to see the nervous system and encephalopathies. I mean, you can get, that spirochete can get into a lot of places and start to do damage. When you say and it does damage, how is it actually doing damage? What, what is it physically doing to the biology? So, you know, some of it is what it, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Some of it is actually the the way that bug, the bacteria replicates and multiplies and this what is it- This is Bergdorfi, the-, the, the Correct. Yeah. So there are, you know, chemicals that they, that it makes in a sense that is toxic to us. Some of it is our own immune response to it. So the, so the bacteria is sitting there, but our body knows it shouldn't be there. So it's like trying, but it's not really working. So it's just getting into a, into a tailspin of mm -hmm. inflammation, but the, but the, Bacteria itself, well, again, whether it's Bartonella, you know, or, or Borrelia burgdorferi or Babesiosis, any of the, these infections or Lichiosis, I mean, they all have sort of their own way of, of causing damage, right? But a lot of it also is our immune response to those bugs 
Sometimes it's a lack of immune response that allows that bug to keep going and doing mm-hmm. the damage it's doing. And sometimes it's, it's, it's the bug, it's, it's our immune system itself, right? So it's, it's complex. It's really complex, as you can Absolutely. see. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I, I, one of the symptoms I remember is that my muscles, this is after a few weeks later, were squeezing, like I'd have this squeezing sensation. What is going on there? Well, why is the body having that response? Do you know? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of patients get muscle pain and, you know, again, I think about it as, is it that the Lyme is actually in all the muscles? Right. Or is it the immune system, you know, trying to fight back? And that's kind of where it's, it's winding up. I think you're asking some really great questions. I don't know if anyone's actually looked at the specifics of that physio- physiology and like what actually is happening, but, you know, broadly speaking, I think a lot, most of the symptomatology that patients are having, whether it's with Lyme or Babesia Bartonella, has to do with where the bugs are and how the immune system reacts to it. And that's, I think, the important factor. So I think about it even, let's say, with COVID, right? So, so you know, unfortunately, you know, there are, you know, millions of people, right, who have been, who have had COVID. Some people got, get over it fairly quickly, right? Their immune system does what it does and, you know, and they're done and the virus is gone. Others, right, have lingering symptoms for months and months and even years, a year or more now. Some patients won't have lingering symptoms for months and months, but will still, you know, they might wind up in the hospital. They may be very, very ill. And, you know, again, the the question is, is it about the virus itself? Sure. Is it, or is it about the immune response to the virus? And, and again, I would argue it's both. And I think the not, same- It's not you, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to find the line, I'm sure. Yeah, so, and I don't, again, I don't think it's one or the other. I think you have yeah. to look at it like it's both and the same, and that's how I look at it with Lyme as well. Right, right. Okay, so, you know, the, the bug has moved into very suburban settings, maybe even urban settings, I'm not sure. So- what, what are ways that people should be, in your opinion, approaching being in nature, being exposed, that is both safe, you know, smart, but at the same time, not paranoid? Like, where is that line for you in terms of what you suggest for how to actually engage with wildlife in a way that protects you from Lyme? It's a great question. I don't know how not to be paranoid. I'll be totally honest with you, because it's just because of the reality that I see, right? Yeah. But but I would say that there are lots of things that people can do. And I think that the more conscious you are of, of what can happen and the more time you take to be diligent, you know, mm-hmm. the better you're going to be and the safer you're going to be, right? So mm-hmm. in the old days, right, I'm kind of dating myself here. Back in the old days, we would just, you know, put on some sneakers and, you know, go for a hike, right? Sure, we wouldn't yeah. even think about it. Now you have to plan, right? You yeah. do have to plan a little bit. So I really encourage people to think about their clothing, right? And so you have options or clothing that's that's uh, basically treated with insecticides. Mm-hmm. Um, you can spray your clothing with insecticides. And, he- and here's the whole thing, right? I- it just kills me because I love being natural and I love, you know, being as holistic as possible. And this is the area where I'm going to say like point blank to everyone listening that the natural stuff doesn't work. Mm. I've had too many p- patients still get Lyme disease using essential oils and other things. I am very concerned about that, the effectiveness of them, right? I would love that to be the, you know, be the sure. answer. But so this is a case where, you know, maybe the clothes are treated with permethrin, for instance, maybe not, okay, if people don't want to go that route, but the skin needs to be treated. And, and ideally, picoridin is probably my preference right now. It is a chemical. The safety data though is better than the DEET. So back in the day we were using a lot of DEET. I rarely use DEET anymore. I do recommend picaridin. It does seem to stay on the skin longer and, you know, maybe a little more effective at preventing the tick attaching and even, you know, for mosquitoes and other things. So, you know, you treat, you treat again, if you're going to be out for a long time, you know, if you you know, are allergic to some of those products, you know, then you obviously 
anything is better than nothing, right? So then you go to the more natural products, right? I'd rather people be protected if they can't use the chemicals. Right. But, but just to understand that, you know, with the more natural stuff, you may have to apply more often, then sure. it's not going to last as long. And then, you know what, and then you do tick checks. I mean, I think this is really key. Take you know, you, first of all, when you're outside, you stay away from the, you know, like tall grass, right? Generally speaking, like the lower the, the, the shrubbery is and the, the grass is the, the better, the ticks are not going to attach. Yeah. You know, I've had so many patients who have gotten ticks from beach grass, you know, so they're walking on the beach and on the side, they have these like tall willowy things, I guess they call it's called beach grass. So ticks love that they like hang out on that. So you want to stay away from where things are like flowing and high and, and stick to like low, low grass, or if you're hiking, right, stay on the trail you know, stay away from the sides of the of the trail. And then when you come back inside, yeah, then you do a head to toe tick check. And I would argue that you probably need to do another tick tra- check a couple of hours later. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes those ticks that you haven't attached yet, right? So you take your clothes off, you know, you kind of you have someone else hopefully help you. I think if, if you just are sort of aware of it, you can still have a good time, you can still enjoy nature, you just have to be, you know, yeah, if you yeah, can see it, that seems to be the key. Because one of the things I can do in my house is I'll have to, my boys take prophylactic herbs if we see anything, but you have to see something to know that, you right. know, because because speed is of the essence. So, and there's, you know, this been this myth, I guess, that the, the bug has to be attached for 12 hours or 18 hours or something, but that's not true. No. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's interesting because, excuse me, uh, Powassan virus, mm-hmm has been shown to be transmitted within 15 minutes Mm. of the attachment of the tech, right? So everyone sort of knows that there's data for that. So we know, you know, Powassan virus 15 minutes. And then, right, all the literature says, you know, 72 hours or 48 hours for a tick to be attached to get Lyme. And the question is, like, why would the virus, you know, be transmitted in 15 minutes, but Lyme takes so much longer? And the answer is it's not doesn't take that much longer, right? And that's what I worry about. I've had I've had patients who know when the tick attached because they know their exposure, and they remove the tick, and they still wind, wound up with Lyme disease, and and the tick maybe was attached for two hours or less, right? And so I see it in practice. I I wish there was data. I wish there were studies that yeah. would prove that, so that doctors would be aware, practitioners would be aware, but. Yeah, I think you can't go by the length of time anymore. Sure. Yeah. So, h- how do you deal with the psycho-emotional aspects of your work, in terms of the, the heavy emotional load of people being so frustrated, and, and you even as a clinician, how do you keep your boundaries, or how do you, you know, what are your, what is in your toolbox for how to keep yourself positive and and, and maybe to help others do the same. Yeah, that's a that's such a great question. I think it's really yeah. I see it two ways, right? So I spend a lot of time speaking to to patients about self care and what they need to do to heal, right? The things that the boundaries that they need to set to get better, whether it's you know with a partner or or other family members or friends, right? They need to to work on the 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 noise around them right? That's affecting them. That's causing stress. You know, I encourage for my patients, definitely, if they don't like the term meditation, we find other ways for them, whether it's belly breathing, you know, like the James Gordon stuff, or whether it's, you know, whatever they can resonate with, that they can take some time to calm the nervous system down, maybe affect it, you know, in a positive way, the vagal nerve, you know, whatever they can do. So we talk about, I talk about that a lot with patients, because I, I think that many of the patients who are chronically ill do have significant trauma in their life or stressors. And that will, you know, that will impact how their body deals with, with healing. On the, on the flip side, right? So I am very empathic and I feel my patient's pain and I want to help, right? And that's my my mission Mm. all my life is just to help people. And so I do have a tendency to carry a lot of that. And so I have to be, as I give my patients the advice, I have to give myself the same advice and take time for myself. So there's, you know, constantly thinking about my self care, you know, what, what, you know, makes me happy, whether it's, you know, finding time, 
I, I love, I love being out in nature, right? So I love to go for a walk and I'm safe and I'm trying to, you know, protect the ticks and all that. But like being out in nature for me is meditative. And so, you know, if I can find time, especially when the weather's nice, this is, this is the opportunity. I try to find time to meditate. I might not do a half an hour meditation a day like I would like. That might be my goal. But if I get in even five or 10 minutes, I know that that has a positive effect. So, but it's, but it's difficult. You know, I had, I had a, a particularly difficult week this week mm. with some cases that, you know, were really hard for me, you know, a patient that I've been, that I've seen for probably 15 years, you know, who, who has a diagnosis that, that is, uh, you know, pretty, you know, significant and, yeah you know, seeing her go through that and now, you know, sort of definitely impacted, impacted me, some other patients I've seen. I mean, generally it's been difficult this week, is, you know, is, you know, sometimes we have those weeks where I really emotionally connect to the patients and then feel it. So that's the opportunity I have to take, I have to recognize that. And I have to make sure that I, you know, I, when I leave, the office that I am doing the things that I can to help preserve my own health. Cause sure. I'm, only as good as, you know, like my patients can only get better if I'm better myself, right? If I can take care of myself. And, you know, I personally, I, I did have a, a pretty bad case of COVID back in January. And, you know, I sort of debated how open I was going to be about my health journey. Right. And then I realized, you know, wh why not be more open so patients understand. And, and I think about that time that I got COVID and I, you know, I recognized that I was more stressed. I was not doing the self-care that I needed. Mm. I was, I was, you know, I was not doing the things that I know I should have been doing. Right. And when I got sick, you know, that was the wake up call. Like, you, you know, you, you let your guard down. You can't do, you can't afford to do that because right. you can't afford to be sick. And I was pretty sick. So I, you know, I'm learning, right. As we all learn, right. Absolutely. What about you? What do you, how do you handle that? Yeah. In fact, I had the similar experience when I did have the Lyme symptoms that summer two years ago that, well, you know, I have to engage my self-care practices in a deeper way. And, and luckily it, it, I moved past it pretty quickly, seemingly, Good. but I think for me, one of the things that, that seems really important is like rituals of like closure and uh, after I'm done working or even in a, in a very subtle way or small way in between patients, you know, and sometimes it's more difficult if I'm very busy or, you know, I have a, a lot of things to do, but it's when I make those conscious, you know, like even if a, a patient goes to change and it's a little easier for me because I'm more seeing one patient at a time, but if I go sit in a waiting room, like do I check my phone and answer something or try to get some work done or do I just breathe? And do I just like take in the moment and, and ground my feet and, and not have to feed my mind, but just instead like feed my spirit and just quiet down. And it, it not only helps me, but it, it makes me a more effective practitioner, I think. When I go back in, I'm a little more focused. So I, I feel like those little things and then certain things I do, you know, to close my practice at the end of the day, whether it's a mantra or a visualization or something, you know, certain smokes or oils, just to give me a, a sense of like, okay, what I, what I worked on here stays here. I mean, maybe I'll study a case later or write an herbal formula, but in terms of the emotional energy of it, you know, not to take it home with me. And right. I guess one of the positive things when I work in a city is my commute is very long. So there's downsides to that. But one of the positive is, is it creates a very strong boundary. So, you know, it's, 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 it's all of those things, but like I'm learning as well, for sure. We all, we all have to, yeah. we're going to remind ourselves because none, none of us are perfect. And again, we live in a very stressful world and we have stressful, you know, jobs and people depend on us, not just patients, but family and all that. Right. So I think it's something that we should be always thinking about. For sure. For sure. Anything else you think people really need to know right now? Yeah, I think, look, I, you know, one of the, I guess my take home message first mm -hmm. would be that, you know, I really encourage patients to, to listen to their body. You know, we are, we're all, we all have the potential for being intuitive and understanding our body. Some are more intuitive than others, but it's definitely something that you can work on. And so I think about it, like if you know something is wrong, then I encourage people to keep looking for the answer, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like don't leave no stone unturned sort of thing, right? You know, if you're not getting the answers you want, if you're not, people are not listening to you, then find the person who's going to listen to you. 
and think about you in a holistic manner so that you can get, you know, the help you need. So that's kind of what I, right. I, we can talk more about the specifics of Lyme and MCAS, but I just think the right. take home message is really, you know, it's about like, I just, I want patients to be validated and, and know that they, you know, that there's a reason that they're sick and there's an answer. Yes. The answer's out there. They just haven't found it yet. I know that if I wish I had known you a few years ago when I went through it, but yeah, I'm sorry to hear that you did that, but it, but I, I'm encouraged to hear that you're well. And yeah, you're it was pre- pretty, you know, it was a combination of herbs that I prescribed for myself and, and the 10 day cycle of doxycycline. And, and I didn't really feel much after that. I also went off sugar, which I had done some research was really important in terms of not feeding it. Is that something that you've come across? Yeah, I, actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I love talking about diet and I, and I do think that, out of everything, if I had to pick like one thing that I would want patients to really be, you know, conscious of is, is really, yeah, the intake of simple carbohydrates and sugars, hmm. um, because I do think it feeds it, but I, and I also think it suppresses the immune system. Right. So not only is it, again, like the bug is now getting fuel to, to multiply and live more, but it's also because our immune system then gets suppressed. So it sounds like you, you had a really good approach and, and I'm glad you took antibiotics. I'm sure that you weren't happy about doing that, but I'm glad you did. Yeah. It's, it's like an insurance policy and just in case right. you've killed. I didn't want to second guess myself down the road that it wasn't aggressive enough. So I thought, let me just do the 10 days and around the herbs and, and it seems to have been a good balance. So, yeah. It's good. And what, what herbs do you use for that? It, that is- like you were saying before, it really is specific in each case. There are certain like herbs that I will use depending on whether it's presenting as what we call like either a hot condition or a cold condition, right? Mm-hmm. And generally, initially they're hot, but they can become cold later. For me, it was because I had the night sweats and the fevers and such that it was more cooling herbs. So like Ching Hao Artemisium was one of the ones I, I believe I used. I think I used Honeysuckle, Jin Yin Hua. The, the roots there of knotweed was certainly in the formula. A few okay. other herbs that like Romania root that protect the yin and fluids of the body because I was losing so much through sweat. A few herbs like dogwood bark and and actually trying to think of the English and not the Chinese, the, the one mistletoe. Oh. So some of those which were good for like the back and the spine and some of the pain that I was feeling. And then herbs that are anti-spasmatic you know, there's combinations of like a certain peony flower root and licorice, which together work to like be anti-spasmatic. So that was important for that squeezing feeling I had. And then I, I, I snuck in a little low dose of some warmer herbs to make sure that I, I wasn't like freezing my system, that I actually had something that could be, that could counter a bit and and work at the, what we call the yang levels, which is like to keep my immune system activated and strong. Uh, right, so it's probably it's like that balance, right? So, what exactly. do you use in that? So, what do you use for the warm herbs? Um, I don't remember what I used in my case, but it, it, some simple general ones that you could use were like the root of cinnamon, the root of ginger, certain types of like cloves. So, there are certain herbs that are e- even something which is more gentle, but I find always very effective, which is like fennel seed or fennel root. So, th- those are, are, very, are warming, but they're they're not overly drying or anything like that if you're having sweating. That's so, interesting because, you know, in sorry to interrupt, but no. there was a study that came out of Johns Hopkins a couple of years ago, I think, looking at some herbs and their effect on persistent um, Lyme disease. And they found that oregano oil, cinnamon, and clove, and, and it's not clear to me if it was it in, all in combination or, or separately, but they all had activity. They had basically antimicrobial activity right. and could kill persistent infections. So I think it's interesting, you know, how you're using it and how, again, from like the Western perspective, how we're looking at them and it's sort of the overlap is right. It's yeah. Just, and it's great when you yeah. can combine both, when you have the, the, the holistic point of view to say, you know, this is... We don't just say that because it kills, it treats every, everything, you know, like the people who are taking like ginger for arthritis all the time. And it was great for maybe half the population who are having more cold condition where it's like locked up and more difficult in cold weather and have other signs of cold in their body. But for other patients who are, you know, hot at night and have difficulty sweating, a woman going through menopause, for instance, the right. ginger would be terrible for them. So it's like it had to be very specific. But yeah, it's it's great when you can combine the two. It gives you extra confidence too, knowing that, okay, there's some data and some studies here that are showing chemical constituents that are effective. And I have 2,500 years of Chinese medical written, you know, empirical evidence 
that's giving me a sense of, okay, this is grounded in something that's almost timeless in a way. So yeah, and there are other herbal traditions as well. Of course. Of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's so beautiful and wonderful that you're taking the time to listen. And so you're an R monk in Westchester? Yeah. So no, I'm, I'm actually, my practice started in Armonk and was called Armonk Integrative Medicine. We've moved actually to Purchase, New York, which is in Westchester, but a little bit south of Armonk. And uh, the new practice is called AIM Center for personalized medicine. So we built a beautiful facility with, you know, an IV suite. And I have on board, I have Dr. Lawrence Afrin, who's really one of the world's experts in, in mast cell activation syndrome. I recently hired a, a physician's assistant, Dr. Colin Renard, who has a background in, in chiropractic medicine, actually, but he's functionally trained PA. And, and so we're doing, you know, a lot of work. We can see patients who, you know, really, they just want to be better, right? They, sure. they just want um, to live a, a, you know, a fuller life and have better quality of life as they get older, right? So that's certainly within our wheelhouse of what we do in terms of the, the, the types of procedures we do and, and, and things we do. So we have, you know, we have ozone therapy and 10 pass ozone and, and IV therapy. So that's really great. And we do some anti-aging medicine and, and peptides. But I also really, I think the bulk of my practice really is, you know, for what I would call the mystery illnesses, you know, people who, yeah. you know, they've been to all the doctors that no one has given them an answer. You know, certainly if they think they have Lyme disease, you know, this is definitely one of the places you would want to think about going, but it's even beyond that. It's really, again, because I'm going to take a really comprehensive look at the whole picture. We're going to dig, we're going to cast a wide net and, and do the testing that's appropriate to try to put together the you know, the picture and then come up with a really good protocol, obviously. So that's kind of what our, what my bread and butter is. That's great. Well, I'm so glad it. to hear it. And that's why I wanted to have you on today. So I think it's very important and uh, timely for the season. And Well, thank you so much. Uh, maybe sometime I'll stop by the clinic and, and uh, get some cards for you and stuff, because I'll, I'll certainly want to refer out. Yeah. And, and same here. I'd love to, to, I know there are patients that would really benefit from your approach. So We'll definitely, we'll definitely exchange cards. We'll meet in person yeah, at some point for sure. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure. And be well and uh, enjoy the early summer. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful out. Yeah. It is. I know. Take care. Bye. So thanks so much to Dr. Tanya Dempsey. Uh, a lot of, lot of great info in that podcast. Barrett Martin, by the way, is the musical magician who is, does the uh, intro and extra X, what do you call it? X, X, exit music? What, but there's a word for that, right? Anyway, he did it. He's done all the music for this. So I'm super thankful for him. Uh, just spent time with him this past weekend. So anyway, lots of luck to you. Please take the extra minute and I'm gonna do it for the podcast I listen to too. So I follow my own advice, but take the extra minute to actually write a review if you can and score the podcast or just send it to someone else. I appreciate it. Be well and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Give me some feedback as well. If you have a medical journey that you think is worth sharing, I know it's worth sharing. So please let me know about it. You can contact me directly through the links. All right, be well. Enjoy uh, Memorial Day weekend on the Hunting for Healer podcast. Healers podcast. I'll get it someday. <laughs>